Welcome to Pathway, we're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we wanna say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word give to our text number or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. Well, good morning to all of you, and good morning to you online, and good morning to my peeps up in the venue. My name's Gordon. I'm one of the venue pastors, as well as a marriage and parenting pastor. I always tell our venue folks that we're not better than you guys, but we are above you. (laughs) Hey, uh, so appreciate you. You got it. You just got it. Yeah, because they're upstairs, right? Uh, So uh, we're going to get into walking in the way of Jesus. Appreciate your prayers for Pastor Ron. He's not feeling well, so you get me this morning. So let's pray and let's go. Thanks, Father, for this body. Thank you so much for all the great things you're doing in and through Pathway. And Lord, as we look at your word today, God, would you just open our hearts and bless us and do something that only your Holy Spirit can do. We trust you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, walking in the way of Jesus in the home is what we're going to talk about today. And uh, a home is where you live. So that could be a dorm room. That could be under a bridge. Everybody lives somewhere. But the thing about walking in the way of Jesus in your home is the people that live around you know you really well, don't they? And you can't fool the people that you live around. Like, they know if you're walking in the way of Jesus or not. Kids. How many of you have kids? Yeah, I can't get away with anything anymore because of my kids. Try telling your kids to eat their Brussels sprouts when you're hiding yours under your napkin. Doesn't work. Or, or tell your daughter. My daughter, Bella, she hates going to bed. And so she'll say, Dad, why do I have to go to bed? You stay up late. And I say, well, honey, you need to let those cells recharge. You need to rejuvenate so that you, you're, you're beautiful in the morning. And, she, and then she looks at me and she says, well, Dad, you should go to bed then too because you're so old. You need to rejuvenate. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, Bella, if you want to know the truth, the reason I want you to go to bed is so your mom and I can have a little romance before we get too old to even know what... It is, right? <laughs> you can't get away with anything. And, you, and your, your kids and your family and those around you, they just, they know you, they know things about you you don't even know about yourself. Uh, recently, in the last few years, I got into this, this really strange quirk. I never even really thought about it, but I got into this thing where I started at just random hours in the evening taking a trip to Kroger and buying ingredients 
to make banana cream pies. Mmm, yeah. I, I've gotten really good at it. I mean, I, uh, you know, I do the, the I, I'm not, I don't bake like my wife. Like, I, I use instant pudding. I use graham cracker crust. I use Cool Whip. And then my secret is to roast coconut and put that over the, the Cool Whip. And uh, so recently, I'm, I'm, I'm making a, a banana cream pie, and my wife says, okay, what's up? And I'm, what do you mean, what's up? I'm, I'm making pies for the family. And she says, you know, she realize every time there's a drama or we're going through something stressful or we're having a little crisis in the home, you make pies. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. Like, I thought I was just into making pies. No, I, my personality is, when I was a kid, all hell could be breaking loose in our home. And I would be the one, more cake, anyone? <laughs> because I want peace. And so that is some little quirk that I have. It's some way that I can control things when things feel out of control. And I never even realized that. Because I don't know myself really in a lot of ways as well as my wife does. And I think you guys could all agree. There's things about us that we don't even see sometimes or even know. But you cannot fool people. You can't fool God, and you cannot fool the people that are closest to you. My, my kids can smell hypocrisy a mile away. Doggone it. You know, I've always said marriage is discipleship 101, because you get married, and now you're, you, someone is so close to you, there's, there's this accountability that you've never had before, and it's, it's a little startling. And then you have kids, and it's discipleship 102, because it's even worse with kids. They're so perceptive. So those around us, it doesn't have to be our kids, it could be our siblings, but we want to talk about how our walk with Jesus or how walking in the way of Jesus impacts our home beyond the shroud of religious garb or public perception where the rubber really meets the road. What's the life of Jesus looking like in our life? Um, how well is our spiritual house weathering life storms might be another question we can ask. Um, storms are crazy. Like, I've got, you guys will feel sorry for me, probably you ladies won't, but uh, right now just one of my sons lives at home with, with me, the other one's married now, and so I've got three, four, five, I've got five ladies I live with. That's, I'm sorry, ladies, that's just, that's drama I am not accustomed to. I, I grew up with three brothers, and the way we handled things is we just, we hit each other. But, I mean, ladies are complex. And even our dogs, they're both females. And my dogs have issues. Well, I, I've got a German Shepherd, it's Saray's, it's Saray's dog, and uh, she's moved out, but... She left the dog. Thank you, Saray. And when there's a storm, this dog has huge anxiety issues. And, and this dog will try to get under all the furniture. And, but she, can't, she won't stay still. She'll get under the furniture that she doesn't fit under. And then she ends up dragging the furniture. But <laughs> by the time the storm's over, our house is completely rearranged. I mean, storms. And we all have life storms. And, and that leads me to the big idea, which is walking in the way of Jesus equips and empowers us to weather the storms. Walking in the way of Jesus equips and empowers us. We're all going to have storms. We all have storms. If you live in a family, if you live around people, if you live around yourself, you're going to have storms. Life storms have a way of hitting us. But I want to read something from Matthew 7, 21 through 27. And some of this is, is scripture that we've probably heard a lot. Some of this is maybe scripture we have not focused on a lot because it is so sobering. And sometimes it keeps me up at night, to be honest, as a pastor. The words of Jesus, he says, the, the, the one that we just worshiped, the one that we just worshiped in song, he said this. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Wow. Is that not sobering? Oh, we love John 3.16, and I love John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And yet there's some deep, deep meaning to that word believe. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Because not everyone, there's going to be a lot of people that say, hey, Jesus, hey, I, you know what? I went to church. I threw in a couple dollars here and there. Um, I mowed my neighbor's lawn once. I put a pathway bumper sticker on. And he's going to say, I never knew you. And then he goes on and he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Wow. We've got a picture here of a tornado that ripped through a subdivision. And you can see the devastation. And you just look at the families that that represents that lost their home. But how devastating is it if we build on the sand and we lose our spiritual house? And you know what? We, it doesn't just impact us. It impacts those around us when we build on the sand. Not only do we fall with a great crash, but those around us suffer the consequences as well. So I want to talk about just some thoughts about building on the sand. And the first one is why, why would anybody build a house on the sand to, to start with? And the two things that, as I was pondering this, I mean, we all do. We've, we've all been guilty of it. Trust me. We've all built on faulty foundations in areas of our life. But Two reasons that I could think of is, one, maybe we wanted the more pleasurable view. So maybe we wanted to build our life on pleasure. Or maybe we wanted to build our life on somewhere that was close to things, somewhere that was more convenient. So maybe we wanted to build our life on pleasure or convenience. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. God created pleasure. There's nothing wrong with convenience. I, like, I love a microwave when I'm hungry. It's convenient, right? I love Google. I, I, I feel like I'm really smart now. You know, my, my, my son and I recently, we rebuilt a... So actually, somebody from the congregation gifted me with a, um, an older Pontiac G6. And my son and I completely rebuilt the motor. And I'm not a mechanic. But let me just tell you, YouTube is convenient. It was awesome. It was, it, was a, it was just a fun little time. So there's nothing wrong with convenience. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. Those are good things. But if we build our life on them, we've got it backwards and our house is going to fall. And we can see the devastation of, even in the area of sex, in our, in our culture. See, we've, 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 we've lost the purpose We've stopped building on the firm foundation, and we thought that sex is about convenience and it's about pleasure, when really what it's about is a bonding, a gift from God as a bonding for one man and one woman for life. And that has been so diluted down. It's been built, and we see that house crashing and went crashing and crashing, and we see it impacting our society, and it's crashing and it's crashing and it's crashing. And in the church, it's crashing and it's crashing and it's crashing. And we need to get back to building on the rock as a church. 
We need to be the light to the world to show them what the gift of God really is all about. Side point, that, was, that wasn't in my notes. I don't know. I, um, so sand is convenient. It's pleasurable. But hearing and not doing, I hear, but I don't practice because maybe I don't really believe. Or I have a lack of reverence for God, a lack of a fear of God. Not I'm scared of God, oh, he's going to strike me with lightning, but just a, a, a holy reverence that says there is a God and I'm not him and he's a lot smarter than me. My, I was talking about this with my daughter, Saray, and she said, she said, you know, Dad, sand can be shaped. We can manipulate sand. We can form sand however we want to. But then she said, but even though you could shape sand, you can't shape rock. Rock shapes you. And I'm like, so Ray, you're a genius. So wise. So young and so wise. The rock shapes you. And what Jesus was saying is, hey, don't call me Lord, Lord, unless you're willing to let me shape you. Wow. So I could have got up and done this, and I could have stayed home and ate bonbons. <laughs> Here's another interesting thing. Sand and rock are made of the same thing. The difference between sand and rock is sand is a, a little bit, a little tiny piece here and a little tiny piece there. And so many of us are building our lives on a little tiny piece of Jesus, a little tiny piece of Jesus there, but we're not building our life on the whole of Jesus. I'll take the John 3.16, but don't read me, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Ooh. Tiny bits here and there. What foundation are we building on? Are we building on the foundation of culture? Nothing wrong with culture. There's some great things in our culture. I love the Colts. Sorry, guys, if you're not a Colts fan. I'm so excited about the game this afternoon. Any Colts fan? I knew there was going to be some faithful Hoosiers in here somewhere. What's that? That's the thing. That's the thing. When it comes to sports, there's just no unity. <laughs> just no unity. <laughs> social media. Some of us are building way too much of our life on social media and Facebook. Nothing wrong with those things, but if you're building your life on those things, it's no wonder where there's an epidemic of, of anxiety with our kids and with the adults. Because there's just a lot of junk. There's just a lot of deception. And there's just a lot of things that distract us from the voice, the loudest voice that we should be listening to. And it confuses us. Some of us, maybe we're building our life. Maybe we're, we're propping ourselves up by drinking too much alcohol. Instead of finding our peace and our comfort and our joy where we need to in Christ, we're finding it in other things. That is a house that's going to crash. So we're going to kind of turn and get a little positive now. You ready for some positive? Everybody's like, give me some hope, brother. (laughs) So number one, hearers listen to the way of Jesus with the right heart attitude. We're going to be doers and hearers. We need to know how to hear. we got to hear and do. But how do we hear and do? We're never going to hear and do unless we listen with the right heart heart attitude. What is that? I think it's found, I think a lot of it's found right here in Romans 1, or I'm sorry, Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is uh, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, says, therefore, every time there's a therefore, you got to explain what it's there for. So the book of Romans is fascinating. It, it's, it's, oh my gosh, it's, I love the book of Romans. It tells us That Jesus was a propitiation. He was a substitute for us. That even though we couldn't live this life perfectly, even though we were lost and in rebellion to God, we came out of the womb, sinful creatures. If you have children, you know I'm telling the truth. (laughs) Little sinners. And then they just grow up and become big sinners, right? But because of that, 
God said, you know what? I'm not willing that you perish. The wages of your sin is death. That's the just penalty for our rebellion, for being born in a state of rebellion, for wanting to be independent from God. Because if we want to be independent from God, it's only fair that we can't live in God's heaven. Because if a bunch of people that want to be independent from God want to live in God's heaven, heaven would no longer be heaven if they lived there. And God said, no, I, I've, got to, I've got to pay the just penalty to take care of your rebellion. And so I love you so much, I'm going to pursue you, and I pursued you to the cross, and I became a substitute for your rebellion. The Bible says that he who know, knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so the book of Romans is just telling us, it's, just, it's portraying the gospel in such a beautiful way. And then he, he gets to chapter 12, and he kind of switches gears, and he says, therefore, because God has been so good to you, because he's taken your place, because he's redeemed you, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Singing songs is great. We call that worship. That's just a tiny, teensy piece of what worship is. This is the real deal. To yield ourselves. To say, God, you are in charge. You get to state what my agenda is. No longer my agenda, but your agenda. That's worship. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, stop building on the sand. No longer conform to what the world is doing. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Isn't that interesting? His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if I lay down my life, if I lay down my agenda... And say, God, you get to have your agenda with me. Now, trust me, we all struggle with that. There's a struggle there. There's, a, there's an ongoing struggle. struggle. The, the, building your life on the rock is a process. You don't just make a decision one day and it's a done deal. We have to keep making and making and making that decision every day. And it's a struggle. We, none of us do it perfectly. But our trajectory should be Building and building and building and continuing to build on the rock. I, guys, I have done so many boneheaded things since becoming a Christian. I have made some stupid decisions. I have struggled in areas. And, and, and we all have. I'm not talking about perfection, that we have to be perfect to, to go to God's heaven. God has more grace than you've got sin in your life. That's not the point, though. The point is, how are we building? And we have to learn to lay down our agenda and take up his agenda. But I love this because even though Jesus said, only the one who does the will of my father, how do we learn the will of our father? We don't until we're willing to lay down our agenda and take up his. That's what Paul is saying. To, to Only those who do the will, by the way, is not about works. Some of you are freaking out. You're getting a little nervous because it sounds like I'm talking about it's our works that save us. And I, let me just assure you, we are saved by grace, not of works that we could boast about. But we are saved by grace through faith. See, faith means I've got to trust the living God. So it's really about how do we, how, what, where's our trust? Brent, if I... If you told me that if I gave you $100, you would give me 1000 by Friday. You could turn that $100 into 1000 by Friday. I love your brother, but I'm not giving you my $100 because I don't trust you. I don't trust you that much. I, don't, I mean, that sounds too good to be true. Am I right? In the same way, if we don't believe God, we're not going to give him our $100. I don't know, maybe Brent. I might try it because I know where you live. Uh, but we're only going to obey God to the degree that we trust him. And so it's not about works. It's about trust. If I trust God, I will obey God. 
And so we need to be building our trust because as we build our trust, that's building on the rock. And our foundation gets firmer and firmer and firmer as we go. So trust is a journey and it's a process. Point two, oh, I, I, I forgot one, Psalms 139, 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Another way to say that prayer is God transform me so my house will stand. Root out what is not pleasing to you. That's how we listen with the right heart attitude. Number two, doers of the way of Jesus help others weather storms. Doers of the way of Jesus help others weather storms. See, the beautiful thing about learning how to listen with the right heart attitude is that when I do that, I become transformed from the inside. And more of Jesus gets in me, and eventually, Jesus is going to start coming out of me. And you cannot help but impact those around you. You become a lighthouse for others that are in the storm. And we're going to look at a, a little, are we looking at a clip? Not yet. Don't, don't show it yet, just yet. Um, yeah, show it. Wait. In your notes, in your notes, it says James 1-2. Is that right? Yeah, that's wrong. It's James 1-22. And that scripture says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. You know what? There, there, there are people that chase Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, and they, they accumulate knowledge after knowledge after knowledge because they want to be puffed up, but they're not listening with the right heart attitude, and they're not being transformed. They're being puffed up, and that's just deceiving You can quote scripture all day long, and you can still be a jerk to your wife, and you can still be abusive. I've seen it, because knowledge puffs up, so we can't be merely listeners. I'm going to show you guys a clip of a couple that allowed the Word of God to get in them, allowed the Spirit of Christ to do something in them and how they help someone else weather a storm. Let's look at this. I would like to say thank you, thank you so much to my sponsor, Jeff and Bonnie Mori. I hope I see you one day. I love you so much, wherever you are. How about today? My name is Nora Birongi. I'm currently a substitute teacher and currently I work in one of the schools in my community. We are Jeff and Bonnie Mori and we had the opportunity to sponsor Nora over 20 some years ago. When we were told we had the chance to meet Nora, I, I was almost speechless because we had no idea. We had no idea how much she had grown. We had no idea of the young woman that she became. We saw that she was this advocate for children and for compassion. And then it just felt very humbling. We did something so little. We felt like it was just so little. And then Jeff and I started realizing as we're looking at the small portion that we did and not looking at the, the magnification that God did. And that is through all of the compassion team. My time in compassion, there is this particular particular teacher I remember. She's called Ruth that impacted so much on me. Actually, even the desire for me to become a teacher came from her. My desire for math and English came from her. She could sit down giving her all time just for me to understand. So for me as a child, I admired her so much. The other person would be our youth pastor. 
to me he was like a father figure very passionate about god but also showed us a very good example he taught us how to pray he always made sure that we are fine but also always encouraging us and reminding us of what the bible tells us about our lives it's not just us it's a whole team it's a whole army of people that god mobilizes in order to affect change in the life of a child this picture of what we're doing is is very little but there's so much going on in the background and as that happens it grew her and it made her who she is today which who would have ever thought that she would then get to go to university, get her bachelor's degree in social services, and she's able to move her, her entire family here to the United States in which she still wants to give back to compassion, but she comes here and still continues on as a compassion advocate. And little by little, God opens the door for someone to reach us to say, she's looking for you. I hope I see you one day. I love you so much, wherever you are. How about today? No. <laughs> yes. Eventually, this is possible and it's just like that goes all the way back to a compassion team giving her hope if those tough were not that compassion I don't think my life would be the way it is today I don't think so no I wouldn't I would love to tell this the staff workers at the compassion project there in Uganda Thank you, because you reached in, and not only were Jesus' hands, but were my hands. You were not only my voice, but you were Jesus' voice. And together, what they did was so much more than what I could do in just a single letter. But yet, it was because of their involvement, even far more than my letters that changed Nora's life, that brought us to the point where we were able to meet, to realize that you have even your small role to play because that small role doesn't stop with you. It continues on and it, it lights a candle that lights another candle that lights another candle and it becomes exponential and that's in the hands of our God. When Jesus gets inside of you to the degree that he comes outside of you, he does beautiful things with your life. And you get to enjoy Jesus. That's it. That's the stuff. When we become that, we know we're building on the rock. You're going to hear a lot more about compassion. We have a compassion weekend coming up. So Pastor Ron will be talking a lot more about that to you guys. You know... When I was a very young man, I was a drug addict, and my, uh, my two best friends growing up, one died in a shootout with the police, and one died from other drug-related situations, and I was on that path. There, there was nothing going for my life. One Easter morning, I was sitting playing my guitar, and I heard the voice of God. I don't hear voices, but I heard the voice of God, and he said, Gordon, what's Easter mean to you? And that day changed my life, because I realized that on God's busy day, on Easter, he was in my room talking to me, and that he loved me. That love changed my life. I was going literally nowhere, probably dead or prison. And I'm not, I'm not being dramatic. And God profoundly changed me. And when I think of 
the beautiful wife that I got to marry. I think of my five beautiful children, two adopted, and just being able to be in the ministry, be able to be a youth pastor in an evangelistic Christian rock band, all the amazing things God's done in my life. It was nothing that I deserved. It was nothing. God just invited me to make a choice to start building on the rock. And I've done it, and I've done it clumsily, as we all do. But you will never be disappointed in what God will do in you if you just give him a chance, if you just choose to build on the rock, to hear his words with the right heart attitude and do them. Which leads me to point three. Those who remain in the way of Jesus experience God's beauty and live with contagious joy. See, that's it. It's not burdensome to obey Jesus. It feels that way to our flesh, but it's not burdensome to be able to be involved in profound love. That's what he's inviting, and that's what he's calling us, and that's what he's commanding from us, is to live in joyous love. John 15, 7 through 12, again, the words of our Savior. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just, if I, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I've loved you. You know, as a, as a marriage pastor, as a guy that gets to meet with a lot of couples, you know what brings me so much joy and so much confidence is to pray for couples. Because Jesus said... Basically, if you will yield your agenda to the will of God and you will get God's will inside of you and God's will begins to come outside of you and you pray, you can ask for whatever you want, whatever you wish. Don't go home and pray for a Lamborghini. That may or may not be God's will for you. Maybe it is. I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. But here's one thing I know. When I pray for a couple to be restored, I know that's God's will. When I pray for healing and for lives to be redeemed, redeemed, I know that's God's will. I can pray for that with confidence. And I get to see over and over and over again God do amazing things. Because God is for you and he's for your marriage. And it brings me great joy. It's worth all the mess that there is sometimes. And there's great joy in that. Which brings me to a couple of points. Brad mentioned one of these earlier, but, you know, I believe that um, every one of you in this room, in, in our body, if you're married, whether you would say your marriage is a 10, by the way, you're lying, I don't believe you, but if you would rate your marriage an 8, or you would rate it a 2, whatever, wherever you are in your marriage, I would encourage you at some point to jump in to re-engage. Because you know what we do there? We learn how to build our marriage on the rock. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Your house will stand. It won't, it won't just stand. It'll thrive. And you'll be a lighthouse for others. Come to re-engage. It's not too late to register starting January 17th. Also, rooted. Rooted is exactly what we're talking about. It's talking about building your life, not on a knowledge, a base of knowledge, but it helps us to practice. It helps us to walk in obedience to what God is calling us to. It helps us understand that journey. I'd love to see everybody in Pathway go through Rooted as well. I know you can't be at everything at once, but you know, plan it out. But come, this place is gonna be a place that elevates and celebrates marriage because marriage is from God, it's a gift of God. We're going to be healthy here. We're going to get healthy here. And we're going to be a light to the city. 
I told our, our team when we first started, revival is gonna happen in the area of marriage because marriage is losing its significance in our culture and even in the church. And we're gonna take it back in Jesus' name. Yeah, we are. We're, for instance, 2016, we're like uh, 1,500 people through our marriage discipleship program. And we wanna keep, even in spite of COVID, and we're gonna keep going. We're not stopping. We're gonna see marriages blessed and marriages built on the rock. Those of you that are getting married, that's our same hope for you, that you will build on the rock, that you'll hear the words of Jesus and you'll do them and you will be blessed. I'm gonna leave you with three questions today. I think they're gonna be up. You can write them down. And I hope that you'll wrestle with these this week. I hope that you'll take an honest evaluation. The first question, is Jesus the loudest voice in my life? Is Jesus the loudest voice in my life? It's interesting, the Word of God tells us that, that the Holy Spirit is a still small voice. So why am I asking you if Jesus is the loudest voice? If Jesus' voice is a still small voice, what do we need to quell? What do we need to stop listening to so we can hear his still small voice? So that his voice is the loudest. Is Jesus the loudest voice in my life? There's a lot of voices clamoring for your attention. Is Jesus the loudest? Which brings me to question two. What voice do I need to silence? What voices do I need to silence? And then number three, who is being impacted by the life of Christ in me? Who is being impacted by the life of Christ in me? I realize that there's some of you that have, maybe you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, and I'd like to invite you to do that this morning. God loves you. If, if the voice of the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, listen. Listen, you'll never regret it. You will never regret it. God loved you and he pursued you by becoming flesh, by living a life here and suffering and dying to pay for everything that you've ever done wrong. And we've all done wrong. He paid for your sin and rebellion. It's done. It's wiped clean. The only thing you need to do is believe that God is that kind that he wants to save you. And you put your trust in him today. You say, God, thank you. I want to lay down my agenda for your agenda. Help me know what that is. It's that simple. It's not always easy but it's simple. Lay down your agenda. Take up God's agenda today. You can do that. For those of us that maybe we've been walking with Christ a long time, but maybe we've got into that zone where we've been listening and we've been accumulating knowledge over the years, but we've, we've long since stopped letting it impact our life. We've been building on sand a little bit of Jesus, a little here, a little bit of Jesus there. But we're not building on the whole of Jesus. Would you do that today? Would you just make a commitment to say, Jesus, I want to build on the rock. I want all of you. Jesus gave us all of him. He's there for the asking. But he wants all of us. He wants all of you. All of Jesus for all of you. And guess what? We're getting the way better end of the deal. The way better end of the deal. Thank you, guys. You've been so attentive. Um, I'm going to pray for you, and I hope you will consider this. I hope that you will listen to the voice of God and respond. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share your word. Lord, I pray that these truths 
will sink deep, that they'll root deep, that God, that you will continue to just uh, mold us, that you'll continue to draw us, Lord, as individuals, but also as a body, to realize that, that you've given us a great responsibility. You've given us a great work to do, to help others weather the storm and to stand in our own storms as we build on the rock. God, we trust you. You're so good. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And I know, God, I can pray for these things with boldness and confidence because I know it's according to who you are. It's according to your will. We do pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Love you. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the give button on the web or the app or text the word give. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.